Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Um, I should begin to say two things. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me. I am so, I would not say proud, I am proud, but also honored to be here and enjoy this, this meeting. And the second is just to, to complete what Chuck has said on me. I have, it is true, totally true, I have a personal vendetta against my personal enemy, the tubercle vessels. But I should say in confidence, I did not win the <laughs> vendetta. There is a lot of work to be done, a lot of work. And uh, I say that to the young people, they are not going to be out of work if they work really on TV. Because perhaps in, in some Western countries, TV is more or less controlled, but elsewhere it is not the same at all. Well, that being said, uh, thank you very much, Chuck, for what you say. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, I am very bad with electronics. Uh, you know, electronics and me, they, they, we don't like each other. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> but, but, you know, I am not good in that at all, but I don't like other people to help me. It's, it's the contradiction of human beings. So, I am going to tell you my story my story, the way I see the problem. You see, in the first slide, I like to have pointers, but okay, nobody is willing to give me pointers. Uh, I summarize here, for me, the treatment of TB. The real treatment of TB from the early treatment with streptomycin and isoniazid. It, Oh, yeah, it's too, com it's, uh, too, too complicated for me. Much too complicated for me. You know, initially, uh, the good treatment of TB was INH plus streptomycin plus PS. Huh? We know that it has been invented, I would say, uh, in the 50s. I would say about uh, 1960, it was uh, the standard treatment of TB. And this standard treatment of TB is here represented in that slide in light blue and as you can see during the first two months of treatment there were a very deep killing uh, uh, I should say that here on the on the uh, uh, on this axis it's uh, the in the x axis is the, the time in months and in the uh, in the in the y axis is the number of of bacilli in the lung in the lung of of, of mice or in the lung of human beings in the same and as you can see if you look at the blue line during the first two months there is a very rapid killing about five lots killing, even with streptomycin and isoniazid. But what is very special is after the first two months, there is a very clear slowdown in the killing. And after nine months, the, 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 the killing even became slower, and everyone who is as old as me, and that can remember that time, we have to treat patients for 18 months or two years to, to cure them. And even after two, two years, there were about 5 to 10% of relapses. So INH, streptomycin, and PS was not, I would say, a real sterilizing treatment. 
And then came, like Zorro, like came Riff, Riff. And it is here in red. And with Riff, you see that the initial killing is the same. But the killing was much speeding after. And at six months, almost all, all mice or patients were culture negative. And after nine months, no relapse at all. So it's very clear that the addition of RIF has increased the sterilizing potential of the regimen. And then, PCA came, came again, or came back, because PCA was discovered, roughly speaking, at the same time as Arizona, I did. And with, with the addition of PCA, the addition of PCA and RIF, in fact, we had a treatment of six month duration and with no relapse, or almost, almost no relapse. One to two percent relapse. And it's very clear that in, in that, I would say, 90, in 90, uh, between the 80 90 was the, 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 the so called short course chemotherapy. And we have passed for two years or 18 months to six months, which is wonderful. But, and why? Because, because we have increased the killing of persisters. You know, the persisters are those bacilli that are not actively multiplying, that are persisting, that are not willing to be killed. Because they are not metabolize, metabol, metabol, metabolizing actively, and you know, and, and it's clear to see that the RIF and PCA are increasing this potential. But but it's not enough. It's not enough. And my goal, our goal, is you know, uh, here in this broken uh, yellow line, is to to kill them with the same speed from the beginning to the end. And my goal is to have a treatment that would cure TB in two, three months. I don't believe that with the weapons we have now, we can expect more than that. You, you know, more than, you may ask me, and that is a discussion, why? I don't know. Perhaps it's the biological barrier that MTB oppose, is opposing to, to, to the drug because he has reserve to, to survive for, for a long time. I don't know exactly. Nobody knows. It's just speculation. So it's my goal. And so how can we reach that goal? We can reach that goal with rifapentine. Rifapentine, as you know, is a long life lived, long lived rifamycin, uh, which has been developed for once weekly administration in the past. And uh, uh, rifapentine offers potential for improved activity because of its superior PKPD profile. And in this table, you can have, you can see the, the difference in the, in the parameter between rifampicin and rifabantin, given each of them at 10 mg per kilo in the mouse or in human. The half-life of rifampicin is 2.5 hours. Uh, I would say that all this work is chuck work. But I present it as my work. But in fact, <laughs> you know, I mean, Chuck is a very nice guy. You can steal him, and he is not protesting too much. So the half-life of it, everyone knows, is between two to three hours. The MIC, that is the minimum inhibitory concentration, the, 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 huh? uh, again, the bug, is 0.25 micrograms per milliliter. And uh, one of the key parameters 
the pan macrodynamic parameter, which is the C max, which is the peak concentration ratio on MIC, MIC 90, which means MIC for 90% of the TB strain. This ratio, you know, the peak and the mic, you know, it's 58 from, uh, for refurbishing. That is, the, the peak is 58 times above the mic. So you understand why refurbishing is, is really a potent drug. And then it's another, which is AUC on MIC. AUC is, AUC is the area under the curve. It's no more the peak, it's the entire surface above the peak, of the concentration above the peak. And the, it's easy to understand that the larger this AUC, this surface, the more active may be the drug. And the, the, this ratio is 471 for refurbishing. Now, have a look on rifampentine. The half-life is totally different. The half-life is no more, not two, three hours, it's 15 hours. Five times more. The MIC are more or less similar, or a little bit lower, perhaps one, one dilution. So the ratio C max to MIC is not really very different. It's almost the double because the MIC is a little bit lower. Okay? So there is no big difference. But the big difference is the AUC because it's a, it's a long, long lasting. So the AUC is no, no more 471, it's 2,658. So if there is a correlation between the length of exposure to rifamycin and the activity, rifampentine, rifampentine may be extremely promising. And For you, just to understand, <laughs> it's also check. Uh, here is, on the left is rifapentine. It's the pharmacodynamic, or the pharmacokinetic of daily rifapentine and rifampine in the mouse. In, in, on the left is rifapentine, the blood concentration of rifapentine. And on broken line is the MIC. When you give, when you give uh, rifapentine five days a week, daily rifapentine, 10 mg per kilo, five days a week, you see that during the whole week, there is permanent exposure, permanent exposure of the bug to, 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 to the rifamycin. That is, you know, I mean, I used to, to the, the verb drown. You know, the, the, the bug is permanently below the surface. Is permanently exposed. He is no more permitted, officially, to officially to to do any uh, protein synthesis. And in opposition, look at rifampin. Rifampin, rifampin. You know, every day the concentration of rifampin is below the surface. So the bug may be drowned, but for several hours a day, they can breathe, they can, they can survive, they can, they can do basic synthesis. But, okay, it's my explanation, you know. But it, it would mean also why rifampine, even given daily, is not going to kill as rapidly you know, if you want to, to drown someone, you better to keep his head permanently below the surface. And if you give him, it may take more longer. No, I mean, it's, it's of course, I know well it's elaboration, but it's, we can understand better what, what could be. And it is not totally crazy, that. And... Okay, so now I am going to tell you a story, a true story. In my lab, I had a very bright guy. His name was Ian Rosenthal, 
and he came to improve the, the once weekly treatment of TB with rifamatin. And he tried, he tried, he said, one weekly, that's that. No, that's that one. So I am going to try twice weekly. Oh, he said, why not? And twice weekly was much better, much better. Mm. But it was not perfect. And with Chuck, we, we see that twice weekly, we do not cover totally the, 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 the week. Yeah, the, 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 the exposure to a pharmacist was not complete. And so, once, I remember, Ian came to my, to my office and said, you know, I would like to give it daily, if I it. I told Ian, yeah, Ian, yeah, you're crazy. If I it has been done for intermittent administration, not for daily administration. He said, yes, you're right, but you see, you, you always say that, that uh, we should be scientists. We, we should have a scientific approach. And you are not shocked to give daily moxifloxacin, of which the half-life is 12 hours, it's very close, and you are not shocked to give that. And why would, be you, would, would you be shocked to give rifapentin daily? I say, yes. Okay, I have no argument to give against you. And so, let's go. And so, Ian did something terrible. He compared in the mouse the bactericidal activity of daily with 10 mg per kilo plus H isoniazid plus chiazilamide. And he compared that to exactly the same in which he substitute P for his rifapentin, 10 mg per kilo, five days a week, for RIF, exactly the same treatment. And the results are here. Uh, on, on the X axis, the time in weeks, not in months, in weeks. And here the, the lung say a few, uh, the, the, the normal, the, and you can see that with Rifapentin, 10 mg per kilo given five days a week, you have all nice culture negative by 10 weeks. 10 weeks, not 10 months. 10 weeks, 10 weeks. Eight weeks is two months. Huh? Last time it was that. Huh? 10 weeks is two months and a half. So in two months and a half, all nice are culture negative. Okay, we do not know that if they are culture negative, they will not relapse. And so, he did the study, we continued the treatment, and <laughs> the final results are here. Look at the relapse after treatment for 10 weeks and 12 weeks. With RIF, of course, they were all culture positive. <laughs> so, there is no problem. But with, with RIF of 19, after 10 weeks of treatment, the percentage of relapse oscillated between 0 to 13 percent, and after 10, 12 weeks, no relapse at all, at all, at all. <coughs> I could not believe that. I could not believe that. But we repeat it several times, and it is exactly that. And so, so, I ask myself, because I, I am, uh, uh, I am recalcitrant, as you say. And I told myself, okay, they are culture negative, but are they really sterilized? Are they really sterilized? And because they are culture negative, they don't, they don't relapse. But perhaps they don't relapse because the, 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 the persistence that are still there are contained by the, by the, the specific immunity. I am not sure. And, Several reviewers in papers that we have submitted tell us you should not never use the terms sterile because you have not bring any evidence of the real sterilization. And so I, I redo at that time a review of what has been published in the past. 
the, the old thing that I need water. <laughs> yeah, they want it. <laughs> Absolutely. And so there have been two types of studies about the, the, the steril, sterile state. One has been done by my friend, McCune and McDermott in the past. It's the first paper from McCune, I think, has been done in 56. And in, uh, here I put it 66 because they have done a lot of work for 10 years. And uh, the, to summarize, after culture conversion induced by isoniazid plus high dose PVA, everyone understands what they say by NH and PVA, the relapse rate was 60% without any intervention and 100% after administering cortisol to the mouth. And this is going back in Pasteur, I work with her, uh, repeated, in fact, the study of, of McCune when Rifampin was available. And after INH plus Rif for 12 months, the relapse rate was 0% without any intervention, but was 60% after cortisone, 0.5 milligram daily for two months. So, we decided because, you know, now it's not INH, it's not RIF, it's Rifapatine. We decided to, and here it's the basic study design that we have done. So I told you that I am going to tell you my story, and I will arrive to the points of interest later, of big interest for you later. The, the, the aim of this study was to determine whether intensive treatment with daily, when I say daily, I mean five days a week. Why five days a week? A week just for convenience, because you know the. I don't know. I am sure here you work well on the weekend, but uh, uh, in, in Baltimore it's not that easy to to make the postdoc and the technician to come on Saturday and Sunday. They are very reluctant. I don't know why. Huh? So, for convenience, we treat five days a week, the mice. I, uh, the mice have no union, they cannot complain. <laughs> okay. So, we, to determine whether intensive treatment with daily, five days a week, two months of rifampatine, 10 mg per kilo, plus isoniazid, plus pyrazinamide, followed by <coughs> pH, rifampatine and isoniazid, like in human, leads to true sterilization. And how do, 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 did, we, did we perform? We use a timic nude mice, the new new mice. You know, we, we have no timers, and they are not able to mount any uh, CD4 or CD8, CD4 response at all. They, they cannot mature their, their, T, their T cells. And we gave them two months, you know, the same as this, two PHZ followed by PH. And we gave them for three, six, nine, and 12 months. Because I did not know, you know, I mean, uh, I did not know how long I, uh, I was even, because of Mrs. Gumbach's work, I was convinced in depth that it would take between six to nine months to, to, to get the real sterile state. So, you know, when you have not the response before the, the study, now I am m much more clever now. And then, after treatment, we stop treatment in a subgroup of mice and keep them for three months without treatment to reveal sterile state because if they are, they are, they are living persistent, in the, in the nude mice, they would revive, okay? And we did the same, exactly the same, in normal mice, bulky mice treated as above, but injected with cortisone, 50 mg per kilo, five days a week, for four weeks, upon treatment completion. Huh? And the third group, which is normal mice, 
treat it as above, but without receiving cortisone upon treatment completion. So, uh, and of course we use control, other control, and the other control are exactly the same as this one, but treated with risk. Uh, just to compare. So now I am going to give you the result. Uh, be, be well seated. <laughs> that the first is the lung if you count on treatment initiation. Here you have always on the x-axis the time and in, on the y-axis the number of bugs in the lung. And we and uh, uh, all animals were infected simultaneously, all uh, with the same strain. Everything has been done concomitantly, uh, and by aerosol. And they were all infected with 4.4 or 4.2, you know, because the day after infection we kill uh, five mice to, to count the number of CFU that has been implanted in the lung. So they were infected with the same amount. And during the first two weeks, without treatment, there was active multiplication. And you can see that on treatment initiation, which is at, uh, at zero time here, at two, two weeks after infection, the number of bugs was 7.84 in the bulb C, in the, uh, in the immune mice, and 7.83 in the new mice. So the multiplication was exactly similar. And then we begin treatment, and of course, we kept some mice without treatment to see what they, they were going to do. And it's very interesting to see that all ball C control died by day 22, and all new mice control died four days later, which means, you know, I was speaking about drowned. It's the same here. The absence of immune response make the nude mice dying after the other because they are not drawn by the, by the inflammatory response. And we know well that the, 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 the inaccurate TB in, the, in miliary TB, the patients are dying from the inflammation Inflammatory, they are, they, are, they are drowned by the inflammation. Okay, so we begin treatment. Let's see. Here is after one month, four weeks. The bulb C, that's the immune, and the red are the new mice. Both responded well, but you know, it's very clear that five days a week treatment was much more active significantly in, new, in both C than in new mice. One log more. And at two months, exactly the same. So the immune containment and helps, helps the drug treatment. <coughs> we say INS with amycin, with amycin, and pyrazidamide. Okay? You see the big difference. One log in both C, two logs in new mice. And at three months, they were all culture negative. Likely because the green would have been culture negative at 10 weeks, as we have seen before, you know. But, you know, I mean, when you do experiments, you cannot have nice, 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 nice. It costs a lot. <laughs> so my conclusion of that is the response is significantly slower in new mice than in normal mice, but all mice were culture negative by three months. So now what? So now we continue treatment in these mice, and a subgroup of mice was stopped at three months, and kept without treatment for relapse. <coughs> the question is, question $1,000? Uh, 
elaborate after treatment for three months with two months of rifamantin isoniazine pyrazinamide followed by one month of rifamantin isoniazine. The bulk C, three months, no relapse at all. But we knew that because it was exactly what we have seen in the preceding experiment. And now, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Now, which cortisone? The relapse. 13% relapse, 2 out of 15 relapse. But we make an error, the technician make an error. This mag receive only 0.4 milligram, that is 20 milligram per kilo daily cortisone, instead of 50 milligram per kilo. So they did not receive really high dose cortisone. But despite that, they relapse. And now the new mass, 73% of new mass relapse. So, the culture negative state at three months in normal mice does not mean sterilization. It means that the few persistors that are remaining are really contained permanently by the immune immunity. And so we continue because we have, you know, when you have this result, it's, it's three months after stopping treatment. This. No, not three months. It's four months because you wait for three months and then you... And so now look at <coughs> the last rate after treatment for six, nine, and 12 months is what we are planning initially and no relapse at all. No relapse at all. No relapse at all in those receiving cortisone, in both she receiving cortisone, or in nude mice. So, after six months of, but you know, let's let, let go a little bit here. You may say, you may say here that you have 73% relapse, but you may say if you are very optimistic, you may say more than one fourth, 20, 25% of them were sterilized. After three months, we were able to sterilize 25% of mice. So it is not surprising at all that at six months, in fact, all were sterilized. And so the conclusion is after six months, not a single nude mouse relapse, indicating the spectacular sterilizing activity of rivamatin, and the time to lung sterilization is therefore between three and six months, and the new experiment is in progress to determine the minimum time to sterilization of all mice with the P-containing regimen. So I will tell you that next year. Okay? Okay? So I can stop now. Or I can tell you what happened in the control mice treated exactly the same way with rifampin instead of rifampin. I want to, to tell you something very simple. In all mice, boxy and nude mice, treated five days a week with rifampin, the culture was still positive at three months' time, uh, as usual. I mean, it's, it's not something special. When they were all culture negative, it might treat it with ifapentin. And this, again, emphasized the extreme potency of P over R. Okay. But let's see the details now. Okay? I go. I should have played better my, my game. You see, there's something very curious that happened. That in both C mice, in green, the response was as usual. The decrease was regular. And they were going to be culture negative by four or five.
five months. But in the new mice, the decrease was lower, as with rifafantin, after one month. After two months, you, we were surprised to see some mice with a high rate, high number of CFU. And at three months, it increased a lot. It failed. It was exactly the fall and rise phenomenon that is very well known in, in the development of resistance. Killing and then relapse with resistance. So we were, I was so surprised. I did not believe that because all of us, we are all saying, oh, you know, the, the HIV patients, they respond as well as uh, the normal patient and, and the blah, 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 and the, you know this blah, blah, blah. Huh? And in addition to that, I have learned, because I am not so illiterate, uh, I have learned, uh, read a bit the publication of the mono-resistance to rifampicin among patients, uh, yeah, 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 HIV, HIV who receive rifampicin, uh, uh, and so, me, because I have not original, I said, oh, okay, first, there should be perhaps some, some problem in the absorption of the drug in the, in the, in the, in the mice, huh? in the new mice, it could be, and that truck is coming back again, and second, perhaps I have selected with fungicin resistant mutants. And so, what we did? Uh, we did, first, we did. <laughs> yes, we did a very good pharmacokinetics today. Huh? <laughs> Done by track, of course. <laughs> uh, as usual. And which demonstrates something very simple, that there was no trouble at all in the PK of reef, isoniazid, and pyrazinamide in the dune mice. In fact, in fact, that is what the table is explaining here, that the, 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 when you give uh, reef 10 mg per kilo, in the mouse you have that type of AUC, in human you have in the nude mice, in human. And you give INH, again, INH, you know, it's exactly, I mean, in the same. Because there is not a problem, so it's very clear. There is not, they might be a little bit different, but there is not, that is not the problem. And second, and second, the, the bugs were totally susceptible to reef, and were resistant to INH. And at three months, between 1% to 50% of the CFU were resistant here at, uh, at 12 weeks to 0.2 microgram per milliliter of isoniazid. And here at, uh, at, uh, at four months, at, at three months, no, no, at four months, excuse me, at four months, four months they were 100%, 100% of the bug were resistant to 0.2 and 1 microgram per milliliter of ice So we have killed all susceptible to INH, and they were, remained fully, fully, uh, 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 reef susceptible. And I made for me some calculation, and telling myself that it is well known that the, the percentage of uh, INH resistant mutant in a wild strain of MTB is one per uh, one million. Uh, ten minus six. And because we, we had about ten to the eight bacillary population initially, so there should be about, about two loss. And then the broken line is doing this. And it's very funny to see that it's very clear. It fits well with the theory. We did not 
prevent the selection of INH resistant mutants. We do not. But I think I did something else. Yes. So we, we continue. We continue. It was the same. And here I did something. I asked myself, you know, it's very curious. So reef five days a week was not sufficient. to prevent the selection of the NH resistant mutants. But RIF was active. And was active, you know, <laughs> that is me. I put here in broken line a mock slope parallel to the slope of the initial multiplication. So the bug here, they did not multiply with the same speed as in untreated mice, you know, in the new mice. In fact, they slow down. So it means that RIF, here, here there is no more INH active. So RIF had some bacteriostatic role. It was not able to prevent, it was not able to select its own mutant, but it has some effect. So, the real, you know, we were so surprised with that. And so the question is, what have we done? Perhaps we have not done well. Of course, as usual, we could have done better. But we did a new experiment in which nude mice and boxy mice were treated for three months with, only with reef, with five days a week versus seven days a week. Because, you know, I mean, uh, huh? we, we, so the, you, know, you know the problem with the, the postdoc and the technician. I mean, we have to face, because, you know, for three months, they have to come on, on Saturday and Sunday to treat mice. Huh? Now, because it is possible that five days a week is, is the cause. Five days a week is less active than seven days a week, is the reason. And two, You are good doctors. So you treat patients not with RHZ as we do in mice, because we know that it's orbital, it's just a bacteriostatic drug that does not contribute really to sterilization and so on. But 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 here in the new mice, I don't know. So we, we wanted and I, I was thinking of the reviewer that would say, you know, I, we are not treating patients with RHZ. We are treating patients with R H C E. And we did, in fact, this experiment. I am going to show you the result of this experiment. The first is, is seven days a week treatment able to prevent selection of INH resistant mutants? So don't look at the bulk C. <coughs> <coughs> they are only for control, okay, huh? because we have no time to look at the new mice treated with five days a week here, yeah, or seven days a week, okay? And look at here the resistance to ANH, exactly the same. Three out of 15 in those treated five days a week, uh, seven out of, uh, uh, and four out of 15 in the treated daily. Which means what? In fact, no, for the prevention of resistance, if what I said initially, that when you give RIF, you have few hours per day when they can re-multiply, in fact, when you give that five days a week or seven days a week, you do not change that problem, okay? So five days a week or seven days a week is as bad for the, the prevention of selection. Oh, I I know that now. <laughs> I did not know that before. I was surprised. Two. Yeah, the seven day. Now, is the addition of etambutol able to prevent the selection of INS resistant mutants? And the response here 
It's very clear. You got the nude. RHZ. E. Five days a week, seven days a week. No mutant. The addition of E protected against selection of alien resident mutants when RSZ was given five days a week or seven days a week. So it means that likely the bacteriostatic activity of etorbital was in one way substituting for the immune containment. It had enough to, to stop the multiplication of alienate resistance. And then, is seven days a week more potent than five days a week? Well, okay, I, 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 I skip that. I give you only this one. In this one, you have in blue the bolsi, in red the nude. In straight line, seven days a week. In broken line, five days a week. For both the bolsi and the nude mice. Without real details, it's very clear that Five days a week is much less active than seven days a week in normal mice and in nude mice. Exactly the same. But, but, let's speculate a little bit more. Seven days a week in nude mice is still much less active than five days a week in both mice. So it is terrible. In fact, the, the five days a week, look at the five days a week in nude mice. It's three large difference. It, it's, it's terrible. Okay? Okay, and, uh, and finally is the addition of etambutol increasing the bacterial activity. No, 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 no. Exactly the same. It did nothing. It did nothing. It prevented the selection of etambutol, but it did not prevent because it increased the bacterial activity. Huh? Look at here. If you compare in the bulk sea, five days a week with, without H, without E, and five days a week with E, this is exactly the same. They are not systemically completely different. And seven days a week, no real difference. No real difference. Those, so this, it is true to say that the tomitol has a bacteriostatic activity. It doesn't mean that it has not an important activity, role. It means it is not bacterial. Conclusion, the fact. Two months of rifapentine, INH, carcinamide, followed by rifapentine, rifapentine, INH, given five days a week, sterilize TB disease in nude mice within three to six months. That is, for, for a guy like me, you know, you have, you have not, White hair. You have not white hair. You do not know what is what means to have white hair. White hair means you have been young before the First World War, something like that. <laughs> something like that. At the time, no, 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 no. Listen to me, seriously, because I, I am joking with very serious matter. When I was young. <clears throat> As Chuck said, when I entered in the sanatorium, the chief medical officer told me, your fetcher is behind you. And if you survive, even he said, if you survive, you can work half time at best. He said, he told me. And he was not wrong.
because that was exactly what everyone knew at that time. That is, once a TB patient, always a TB patient, you can stabilize TB, you can die. <laughs> you can stabilize TB, but you never cure TB. And me, I have seen that, and now the sterilization of the disease, which is for me something wonderful. We can sterilize, really, and even in new mice. What is new mice? It's HIV patients. Uh, with less than, well, 100 uh, CD4. It is absolutely wonderful. It's a very big revolution. Nude mice treated with daily RIF, selected INF resin mutant, and not RIF resin mutant. And the addition of etambutol during the first two months, initial phase, prevented the selection of INF resin mutant. Seven, seven, <laughs> seven, seven, <laughs> real delay treatment is on average one to five loss more bacteria than five days a week, both in nude and both in mice. And the bactericidal activity of RIF in nude mice is reduced by one to two logs compared to both sea mice. So the, the, the translate in English, the immune deficient people do not respond as well at all. Conclusion two, speculation. I cannot prevent myself to speculate. One can predict a spectacular efficacy of the two months rifabentine isoniazid paracinamide isomitol followed by pH treatment in humans in the TB disease to date 29. Me, I said officially <coughs> if <coughs> all patients are not culture negative at two months, <coughs> I get a rackery. I said. I send you my resignation and do a rackery. And I, ca I came, and I'm going to tell you something, I, ca I have been in South Africa uh, two weeks ago, and I have seen one of the sites of the TBTC, Study 29, and uh, the nurses were delighted with Rifapentin. Delighted. And they say uh, the response in patients is so much more rapid and total. And so uh, I am sure it is not only an artifact, a mouse artifact. Two, in immune deficient host, bacilli are not contained by their host immunity and can regrow as soon as they are no more under control of antibiotics. And should immune deficient patients with TB be preferably treated daily and seven, <laughs> seven days a week? Not to give them twice weekly or thrice weekly, but real daily for seven days a week. And the inability of daily R is my speculation. The sterilizing but poorly bactericidal the drug to prevent the selection of isoniazid, a potent bactericidal drug, of the selection of isoniazid resistant mutants in the absence of specific immune response is amazing. Perhaps should we increase dose and rhythm of risk? Well, I know Shulk is uh, laughing because he's repeating that for the last, uh, the last 10 years. 10 years? About? Uh, about, yeah. I would like, okay, or perhaps I should not uh, elaborate too much on that. And the ability of etambutol, the bacteria drug, in combination with RHC to prevent the selection of H, retinal mutants in human mice, is also amazing. Does etambutol substitute?
substitute for the immune containment. Yeah, it's really amazing. And that's an acknowledgement. And I thank you for your attention. And you are very nice. Thank you. Thank you. That was that was just fantastic. Uh, you know that we're going to have a bunch of questions for you later. Uh, I know uh, the group of us uh, have some uh, some questions for you, but we'd like to hold off until uh, after Tim's um, uh, lecture. But uh, I just wanted to make a statement um, that thanks to the work of yourself, Jock, and, and your colleagues, and um, as a medical director of a sanatorium, I am just really, really so honored and humbled to be able to tell my patients that their future is still in front of them. And, and thank you for all the work you've done through your career. I really do mean that. Thank you very much, Jacques. Um, I, uh, no, don't thank Chuck. Stop thanking Chuck. He's, his head swells. Hey, um, what I'd like to do now is, uh, I, 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 we, you know, through the marvels of electronics, through the marvels of uh, technology, uh, Tim Sterling is uh, going to join us right now, and he's going to be talking about TB and HIV. And um, what I think is fantastic about this, as we discuss, is you know you just heard some amazing stuff of Jacques' work in mice, and now uh, what we'd like to do is kind of talk about how does that translate, or you know what's happening in HIV and TB in patients in humans. And I'm really honored and to to introduce another good friend, which is Tim Sterling. Uh, Tim, as you guys know, is with Vanderbilt uh, University School of Medicine. And he's going to give us some his, some of his perspectives of TB and HIV co-infection. Timmy, you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay. Tim, Can you hear me? Tim is there, and without further ado, I turn it over to Tim. Tim, go ahead, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dave, and uh, thanks, Jacques. Uh, fantastic talk. I have uh, been asked to try and address some of the issues that have been raised by uh, Jacques talk and uh, we can touch on some it hasn't been evaluated in quite the same way in HIV infected TB patients but there uh, are some issues uh, that um, that are quite uh, similar and, and raise some interesting questions so Dave has asked that I talk about a clinical presentation of TB and HIV infected persons so I'll go over subclinical TB and also the atypical presentation, as well as the issue of immune reconstitution and its effects on clinical presentation. And then I'll focus on the treatment of TB-HIV, issues related to duration of therapy, which is influenced by relapse risk, so many of the things that Jacques has uh, raised, development of drug resistance, uh, particularly acquired rifamycin resistance, and uh, issue of TB drug levels, uh, so again using uh, data from Chuck, <laughs> as Jacques has uh, done as well, and drug, uh, drug interactions. So this slide uh, summarizes uh, a couple of important issues about the diagnosis of TB and HIV infected persons. The uh, first uh, uh, report is from Tanzania in uh, which they were screening patients for a TB vaccine trial. And they looked just at people with a CD4 count over 200 uh, for this trial. And so not with uh, advanced immunosuppression. That's important to keep in mind. And of the uh, 93 patients screened, 14 had tuberculosis. Ten of them had clinical TB, so that was fairly straightforward. They had symptoms or an abnormal X-ray. But uh, four of them had subclinical TB. They had uh, a positive smear or culture, but no symptoms, and a normal chest x-ray. And then there were six more cases identified uh, that were uh, also subclinical. So uh, of the 10 that was subclinical uh, disease, seven were identified only by a positive culture. And another study from Robin Wood in South Africa, among 174 HIV-infected persons, they were all evaluated with smear and culture, uh, seven had already been on TB therapy, but five had previously undiagnosed smear-positive TB. 
forehead smear negative, culture positive TB. Uh, so 5% had previously undiagnosed TB, and the symptom screen was not useful. So this supports the use of chest X-ray uh, as well as sputum culture to rule out TB. And as I think many uh, in the audience know, it's just generally not done in the developing world, particularly uh, the use of culture. Smear negative TB is an important issue in HIV infected persons. The risk is increased. Uh, the estimate is it's about uh, 50 percent. I've cited a, a paper here published in Lancet a couple years ago that was uh, looked at institution-based studies, so it may actually be an underestimate of the proportion that are smear negative. But the important issue is that uh, HIV infected persons with smear negative TB have an increased risk of death. It's increased compared to HIV negative persons because of immunosuppression and compared to uh, HIV positive persons who are smear positive because of delays in diagnosis. So an important uh, issue. Because of uh, these issues, uh, the, this paper published by Kevin Kane earlier this year uh, is important. Uh, it's uh, an algorithm for uh, screening for TB in HIV-infected persons. And this was conducted in Cambodia, Thailand, and Vietnam. TB was diagnosed in 15%. They found that presence of cough uh, for two to three weeks in the preceding four weeks was uh, not sensitive. It was relatively specific, but it was not sensitive. So then they looked at presence of at least one uh, of the following, cough of any duration, fever of any duration, night sweats for at least three weeks in the preceding four weeks. And they found uh, increased sensitivity, 93%. Uh, not that specific, uh, but with a 97% negative predictive value. And this uh, diagram comes from the paper. And uh, this is of the approximately 1,200 patients who reported at least one of these three symptoms. And what I'd like to point out is that uh, if you start here with the 1199, that uh, there were 249 with tuberculosis. There were 1,086 had two negative uh, sputum smears, uh, but of those, 14% had tuberculosis. And then among this group, uh, there were, with the two negative smears, there were 836 with a normal chest X-ray of whom 8% uh, had tuberculosis. And then you can also see from this uh, group three and group four the effect of CD4 count on uh, clinical presentation. Uh, those with the uh, low CD4, uh, less than 350, 10% uh, uh, had tuberculosis. I'd like to present a, a case that illustrates a couple important points, and this, uh, mainly related to the development of tuberculosis after heart initiation. And this was uh, published by Yuka Manabe uh, last year. A 25-year-old uh, gentleman with HIV, diarrhea, fevers, weight loss. He had no cough or shortness of breath, and he had a normal uh, chest X-ray, negative chest X-ray. He had advanced HIV with a very low CD4 count and a high viral load. He was started on antiretroviral therapy, and 20 days later, he presented with cough and fever, and the chest X-ray showed a right upper lobe cavitary infiltrate, and he was found to have culture-confirmed pulmonary TB. And you can see the X-ray prior to heart, which uh, is difficult on these slides, but uh, was read as uh, essentially normal. And then 20 days after starting heart, with uh, clearly a, a large a right upper lobe infiltrate. And so this patient represents what's uh, highlighted in uh, red or pink on uh, this diagram, which comes from a, uh, a summary or review uh, consensus paper from Graham uh, Menkes and others. And this uh, then pertains to uh, people who are not on tuberculosis treatment when antiretroviral therapy is initiated. Uh, they start antiretroviral therapy, and then active TB is diagnosed. So this is uh, known as ART-associated TB, and a subset of these patients could have unmasking uh, tuberculosis-associated iris. So th this TB could, could be previously undiagnosed prevalent TB. 
It could be newly acquired TB since the initiation of antiretroviral therapy, or it may be progression of subclinical TB that was present before antiretroviral therapy, but then uh, reactivated uh, because of the enhanced immune response. And then a subset of these patients could have a, a very enhanced immune response, the uh, uh, immune uh, response inflammatory syndrome. So the, the top uh, portion of this diagram is well known to this audience. Uh, Dave Ashkin and Moss and Narita first published, uh, one of the first to publish on this uh, many, many years ago. So people with tuberculosis uh, in whom it worsens uh, on antiretroviral therapy. So yet another important clinical manifestation. And uh, with IRIS, the clinical manifestations uh, include uh, fever and weight loss, uh, as we've demonstrated, uh, the cough and increased infiltrates. There also may be exacerbation of extrapulmonary disease, particularly lymphatic disease, uh, cervical, intrathoracic, or intra-abdominal. There may be uh, inflammation of the uh, pleural uh, surfaces, pericardial effusions, expanding uh, CNS tuberculomas, and other uh, soft tissue or uh, bone uh, manifestations. It's interesting that these uh, uh, patients are often smear positive but culture negative, so really uh, suggesting that it's an enhanced immune response to the mycobacteria, which may actually be dead. This, uh, these pictures come from uh, the paper from Menkes, uh, and this is a person who did not have manifestations of uh, TB uh, prior to starting antiretroviral therapy, and you can see in panel A, the very pronounced uh, cervical lymphadenopathy, then in panel B, the uh, cold abscess of the chest wall. He also had, in, in panel C, a uh, psoas abscess. Highly active antiretroviral therapy uh, overall uh, uh, decreases the uh, tuberculosis risk, not increases. But there is this so-called unmasking of subclinical TB. And this, of course, is most important for areas with high TB incidence. So when antiretroviral therapy is, is rolled out, which is, it's being, uh, which is what's happening now in sub-Saharan Africa and elsewhere, that there's this uh, concern for uh, tuberculosis uh, that was not uh, noted prior to initiation of antiretroviral therapy. I'd like to just clarify the issue of recurrent tuberculosis. This has uh, important implications for the optimal duration of therapy. Recurrent TB can be either relapse or reinfection. Relapse is disease with the same M. tuberculosis strain as in the first episode. And, and relapse really pertains to treatment duration and treatment effectiveness. And, and Jacques has uh, done a very nice job of uh, going over many issues related to this. Reinfection, uh, something that doesn't happen as much in the mouse, uh, <laughs> depends on the conditions, I suppose, but, uh, but in areas with high TB prevalence, uh, persons with TB can, uh, and, and treated TB can become reinfected. And so that is also uh, a recurrent disease. So it's important to distinguish between those two. In TB endemic area, uh, endemic areas, recurrent TB after completion of therapy is more likely due to exogenous reinfection than relapse. And this has been shown in some nice papers, Annalise Van Rie, uh, more than 10 years ago, and then a recent paper from India published earlier this year in JID. HIV-infected TB patients have a higher risk of recurrent TB than HIV-negative uh, patients, but this is due to reinfection and not relapse. And again, a very nice paper, paper by Pamela Sonnenberg uh, from 2001 and then additional papers from uh, earlier this year. The optimal treatment duration uh, is in current guidelines uh, for HIV-infected TB patients is six months, the same as for uh, HIV-negative patients, and that comes from evaluating a series of studies, uh, many of which are summarized here, and you can see that this first study from Zaire is often uh, criticized because they did not perform DNA fingerprinting and could not distinguish between exogenous reinfection 
and uh, uh, and relapse. So this 9% was felt to be perhaps artificially high. Then looking at the rest of these uh, studies, you can see that the relapse rates are uh, essentially uh, similar. That they may be slightly higher in the HIV-infected uh, population, but they were all relatively small, and so uh, there was no statistically significant difference. So as I say, the, the current recommendation is six months uh, for pulmonary disease, regardless of HIV status, longer for uh, some manifestations of extrapulmonary disease. Uh, but uh, this important caveat that in persons with cavitary disease and a positive culture at two months of treatment, that they should receive nine months of therapy, and that's regardless of HIV status. But it's interesting to note, if you look at the relapse rates among persons who have received six months of therapy, and these are all HIV-infected populations, relapse rate is about 6%, with a range of 3 to 9%. Among persons who uh, received nine months of therapy, the relapse rate is about 2%. Well, what's really needed is a head-to-head uh, -head comparison. Uh, the, 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 there's been a systematic review and meta-analysis, and that was published earlier this year in Clinical Infectious Diseases, and they looked at six randomized trials and 21 cohort studies. They found a trend toward a, a higher relapse rate uh, if uh, patients received uh, rifamycin for six months compared to at least eight months, and also a higher relapse rate if antiretroviral therapy was not used. They also found that uh, thrice-weekly therapy in the initial phase was associated with higher failure and relapse rates than daily therapy. So again, touching on some of the issues that uh, Jacques has raised with uh, intermittency of uh, therapy. So as I mentioned, it, it'd be nice to have a head-to-head -head trial, and, and this uh, study was published uh, earlier this year. This comes from uh, India. Uh, it's uh, good in that it is a comparison of six versus nine months of therapy. Uh, there are some limitations. One is that uh, patients receive thrice-weekly TB treatment, uh, and also uh, this was conducted during a time when uh, antiretroviral therapy was not widely available. So uh, it, it's important to keep these caveats in mind. They found a uh, favorable response rate uh, that was comparable in the six- and nine-month uh, treatment arm. They uh, did find that the bacteriologic recurrence rate was uh, higher in persons receiving six months uh, than those who received nine months. In looking at all recurrences, whether uh, bacteriologic or not, they found no statistically significant difference, although uh, the absolute rate was higher in the six-month arm, and then there was uh, no difference in the rate of death in the two study arms. These patients had advanced HIV, the median C4 count of 160, and a viral load of well over 100,000. All 19 patients with treatment failure developed acquired rifamycin resistance, and there was no difference in acquired rifamycin resistance by treatment arm. This issue of acquired rifamycin resistance, which Jacques alluded to, has been presented in several papers, and uh, I just highlight uh, one here. This comes from TB Trials Consortium Study 23. There's just a, a single-arm study. Patients received isoniazid and rifabutin twice weekly in the continuation phase. So this is the, the last four months of treatment. There were 169 patients enrolled, and there were three treatment failures and six relapses. So an overall rate of about 5%, which is really not that uh, remarkable. The problem was that eight of the nine patients with failure or relapse had acquired rifamycin resistance. And the important things to keep in mind is, first of all, uh, this is a group of patients who received highly intermittent therapy, uh, but even among this group, uh, risk factors for acquired rifamycin resistance included low median CD4 count and uh, a lack of antiretroviral therapy in the first two months of treatment. So again, highlighting the importance of, of CD4 count uh, as well as intermittency of therapy in as far as risk factors for acquired rifamycin resistance. 
Now, as a part of this uh, study, uh, Mark Wiener conducted a, a pharmacokinetic sub-study, and this included uh, 102 of study 23 patients, including seven of eight with acquired rifamycin resistance. And there were some interesting uh, findings. So uh, I'll start at the bottom here. The, the first is isoniazid. It's interesting that the uh, AUC, the area under the curve, is uh, is a bit lower in the acquired rifamycin group compared to those who did not develop uh, rifamycin resistance. It was not statistically significant uh, until after adjusting for rifabutin AUC. And this uh, finding is not that surprising because this would then mean that there would be unopposed rifamycin exposure and that that might contribute, to, uh, you would think that would be important in, in, in development of, uh, of rifamycin resistance. But the other interesting finding was that rifabutin levels were also low. So they were uh, low in the unadjusted analysis on the uh, top uh, row, and then after adjusting for a CD4 count, they were uh, significantly lower in uh, persons with acquired rifamycin resistance. And this just uh, shows uh, the similar things uh, graphically, again, with uh, rifabutin levels being uh, significantly lower in those with acquired rifamycin resistance and with isoniazid levels also being low. Now, I am uh, not aware of uh, acquired isoniazid resistance, and I'd be glad to hear what uh, what David and, and uh, Jacques and others uh, had to say, but it, it's been interesting that uh, unlike what uh, Jacques has seen in the mouse model with the INH uh, resistance, uh, that has not been reported uh, widely in um, HIV-infected persons. To... Uh, help minimize the risk of acquired rifamycin resistance. I think everyone in the audience is aware that it's recommended that persons with low CD4 count not receive highly intermittent therapy. They should receive daily therapy during the induction phase and daily or uh, no less than three times a week during the continuation phase. Now, I'd, I'd like to... Uh, go over the issue of, of drug levels and drug levels during treatment. There have been uh, several papers on this. I don't have time to go through all of them, but uh, this is a, a study from Botswana. Uh, patients, uh, 225 TB patients, they were both HIV-infected and uninfected patients in this study. They all received directly observed therapy. And of note, low TB drug levels were common. And you can see the prevalence here. This is similar to a study that they had reported uh, in 2005, I believe, uh, where a fairly high frequency of uh, low INH levels, very high uh, prevalence of, uh, of low rifampin levels. You can see the ethambutol here. And then pyrazinamide, uh, low levels of pyrazinamide were not that common. But uh, in this 2009 paper, they looked at it in a, in a little more detail. Um, as far as its effect, the effect of these levels on clinical outcomes. So this slide breaks it down according to HIV uninfected, infected with uh, high CD4, and infected with uh, low CD4. And you can see that isoniazid, as well as ethambutol, uh, did not have uh, statistically significant uh, uh, drug levels uh, in these three patient groups. Uh, Interestingly, if you look at rifampin, uh, you can see that there is a statistically significant difference, but this seems to be driven by uh, a high median Cmax in HIV-infected persons with uh, high CD4. I'm not, uh, not exactly sure what explains this, because uh, uh, there's not really a trend uh, going across the, the row. Pyrazinamide, on the other hand, had the uh, highest levels in the HIV uninfected, a bit lower in the HIV uh, positive with high CD4, and then lower still in, in those with uh, low CD4. And if you look here, this is uh, along the y-axis. It's the proportion of patients with poor treatment outcome. And uh, again, there were only uh, 10 patients with low pyrazinamide uh, uh, Cmax. 
but the proportion with uh, poor outcome was about uh, 50%. And then those with a, a normal pyrazinamide CMAX were uh, much less likely to have uh, poor treatment outcome. And then if you look at the, uh, the bottom uh, figure, you can see that the proportion with poor treatment outcome increases as you go from HIV uninfected to infected with high CD4 and infected with low CD4. And the question is, how, how does this relate, the, these issues of pyrazinamide levels and, uh, and treatment outcome? And the, the most important uh, part of this uh, table is uh, the, the last row. So this is the uh, risk ratio uh, for a poor treatment outcome uh, in persons with low versus normal pyrazinamide CMAX, but after adjusting for HIV infection and CD4 cell count category. So even after adjusting for HIV and CD4, low pyrazinamide uh, CMAX was associated with a significantly increased risk of poor outcome. So even though it doesn't occur that com did not occur that commonly in this population, when it did occur, it was associated with poor outcome. I'd like to uh, switch now and talk about uh, some of the other uh, drugs that can be used and the issue of drug-drug interaction. Uh, rifampin uh, can be given with the favarins, uh, but uh, we often consider increasing the efavirenz dose to 800 milligrams because of the effect of rifampin on efavirenz. It can be given with ritonavir, but this is generally not done. We generally don't use ritonavir. And, and the same with lopinavir and vertonavir at very high doses. And this is not done because of concerns regarding hepatotoxicity. Of course, these regimens must also include nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Rifampin should not be given with other protease inhibitors, even if the uh, PI is given with vertonavir. I refer you to this uh, website, which uh, provides uh, an update, is updated fairly regularly uh, regarding these drug interactions. This slide highlights the uh, the drug interactions uh, between rifampin and efavirenz, that rifampin will decrease efavirenz AUC by about 25%. Um, and then there have been several clinical studies. And uh, my take home from these is that uh, in populations where uh, patients weigh 60 kilograms or less, that the 600 milligram dose of efavirenz generally does fairly well. Uh, in people above uh, 60 kilos, you'd be more concerned about dro low drug levels and, and would contemplate using 800 milligrams of efavirenz. I think it's also important to note there's quite a bit of uh, interpatient variability in uh, efavirenz levels, uh, and particularly in those who are also receiving rifampin. This slide highlights issues related to nevirapine. This is not as much of an issue in the United States where we generally would not give rifampin and nevirapine. But in resource-limited settings, uh, fabrins may not be readily available, and this issue comes up. Nevirapine will lower, or rifampin will lower nevirapine levels by 37 to 58 percent. There were three small studies demonstrating a favorable clinical uh, virologic response. Uh, uh, but uh, in, a, in a small study looking at 400 milligrams of nevirapine and 600 milligrams of, uh, of efavirenz, both with rifampin, efficacy was similar, but there were uh, more adverse events with nevirapine. And, and this uh, uh, more recent study from the same group uh, showed that at week 12, nevirapine levels were more likely to be low than with efavirenz. There are no clinical PK or safety studies that I'm aware of looking at the increased dose of nevirapine uh, with rifampin. So the, the recommendation is to consider nevirapine and, and rifampin really when you don't have any other choice. This uh, study from uh, Andrew Bull uh, from a couple years ago in JAMA highlights the issue of virologic control and that the virologic control is not as good when people are treated with uh, nevirapine and rifampin. So if you look at the top portion of this uh, figure, these are people who uh, are, have concurrent, concurrent TB at the start of antiretroviral therapy. And uh, comparing it to those persons without concurrent TB when they start antiretroviral therapy. So these are the patients uh, uh, with TB 
and we're looking at failure to suppress viral load. And you can see that the uh, proportion with failure to suppress is higher in those with uh, concomitant TB. And that's illustrated by these odds ratios, and the combined odds ratio is 1.7. So about twice as likely to have uh, uh, detectable viral load uh, in, in persons who are getting uh, uh, nevirapine or rifampin than those who are getting nevirapine alone. And that effect is not seen among persons receiving uh, fabrins, whether they get it, the fabrins and rifampin or fabrins alone. You can see that the combined effect is, is close to one. Just briefly on new agents, uh, etravirine, uh, rifampin will decrease etravirine. Uh, it's not a good idea to give with rifampin. You could uh, contemplate doing it with rifabutin, but not when also given with uh, darunavir and sequinavir, uh, both of which are usually boosted with ritonavir. Of the CCR5 inhibitors, probably the most data are with maraviroc. Rifampin will decrease uh, maraviroc semen by 78%. Uh, Increasing the Maraviroc dose to 600 milligrams BID uh, may help, but there's a very limited clinical experience. Interactions with rifabutin are not studied, uh, but there's probably just a modest effect. And then the integrase inhibitors, including raltegravir, rifampin will decrease raltegravir CMAX and AUC, as well as trough levels by 60 to 70 percent. So do not co-administer uh, these two drugs. You could give rifabutin uh, 300 milligrams a day along with raltegravir, 400 milligrams BID. So in summary, uh, the clinical manifestations of TB in HIV-infected persons differ compared to HIV-uninfected persons. You're more likely to have atypical presentations or a normal chest X-ray. Uh, there are fewer symptoms, sometimes no symptoms, and this is particularly seen with low CD4. Chest X-ray can worsen on antiretroviral therapy. That's sort of an open question regarding the optimal duration of uh, therapy. Uh, daily dosing of TB therapy is important, particularly in the first two months. There are poor treatment outcomes associated with low PZA levels. Acquired rifamycin resistance is associated with low rifamycin levels and perhaps low INH levels. Uh, but advanced HIV and intermittent TB dosing are also risk factors. And as I said, I'm, I'm not aware of acquired INH resistance uh, being reported. So with that, I'll stop and be happy to take questions. Tim, thank you very, very much. That was an excellent review. Thank you so, so much. Um, Tim, you're going to hang around because uh, we're going to have some questions for you, please. But uh, thanks again. And operator, could you do me a favor? Could you uh, please explain to everybody? There's going to be three ways we could ask questions. For those of you in the audience, please just raise your hand. We'll get a mic. For those of you on our webinar, you can either ask a question by asking the operator, and she'll tell you in a second, and telling her that you have a question, or you could do it by um, uh, by writing in on uh, on the webinar, and we'll explain that. And uh, but we'd rather hear from you. So, operator, would you do me a favor and explain to our listeners how they can ask a question? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. If you would like to register a question, you may press the one followed by the four on your telephone. You will hear a three-tone prompt to acknowledge your request. Your line will then be accessed from the conference to obtain information. If your question has been answered and you would like to withdraw your registration, please press the 1 followed by the 3. If you're using a speakerphone, please lift your handset before entering your request. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to register a question on the phone lines, you may press the 1 followed by the 4. And then, and then lastly, thank you, operator. And then uh, lastly, if you have a question you want to ask it on the live meeting, on, if you just go to your Q&A on the top and type it in, and uh, then we'll be more than happy to try to get to it. So, Jacques, it's not that easy because, uh, I, I, you know, I'm going to start with uh, a question. Well, actually, Tim, I'm going to ask you a question first, if it's okay. So, Tim, you know, you, you talk about, and we, you know, the study where you have the low PZA levels, you know, in our experience, you know, when you have a low PZA, a PZA is so, so well absorbed that it's very rare, at least in our experience, to have low, a lower than expected PZA level, you know. And I guess my question for you is, Tim, is what's the possibility that a low PZA level is just a sign of non-adherence, a marker of non-adherence, and that the real reason they're failing is not the PZA, but this is a true, true unrelated. Any comments on that? 
Uh, I so it's certainly an important question and something you'd want to rule out. I think everybody in that study got directly observed therapy. Uh, I don't, of course, as we all know, I mean, even with DOT, there may be people who don't get it or receive it or, uh, you know, that sort of thing. So, yeah, it would be a, an important uh, issue. Uh, as I uh, noted, it's it's uncommon. I mean, I agree with you. I always think of PZA as being the drug that uh, uh, we're most likely to get good levels with. And I actually, we have Chuck here, and I really don't want to hear Chuck, but I guess we have to. Chuck, what do you have I to want to hear Chuck. Oh, yeah. come on, Tim. You, you know, Tim, Tim you don't is, really. Tim is my friend. <laughs> David's not my friend. So, well, uh, as one of the co-authors in, in that paper, uh, I was very, very surprised by those results and initially had zero explanation for it. Um, when we use our markers of, you know, advanced disease, whether it's the CD4 count or the HIV viral load, what we really don't have a real good handle on, and those remaining CD4 cells are those the ones that control TB or those other ones. Uh, so it, it's a, still a relatively crude measure. So it is at least possible um, that what this is a signal for is that those are the patients who have the most uh, immunological derangement and, and it's starting to show up as effects in the absorption of PZA, which as was pointed up, is usually very, very, very well absorbed. The other thing I will point out, is all of those values were with doses of 35 milligrams per kilogram, which of course in the original BMRC studies, that was the dose used, but that is not the dose generally used in the United States. So even in the low PZA group, those serum concentrations of PZA were higher than what we typically see in many American patients being treated. So I think it may be just a marker of a general more a derangement of the immune system rather than the PZA effect directly. Right. Actually, and you know, while we're talking about PZA direct effects and stuff, you know, I, I kind of think, you know, just as a quick question, I, I think it's a, you know, as Tim pointed out, I'm, it's very interesting that in Jock studies, most of the resistance we saw was INH resistance, whereas, you know, in, I have to be honest with you, with most of the HIV positive individuals who we see who fail, you know, they usually fail if they're going to fail, rifampin resistance. Yeah. Shock, any thoughts on why there may be a difference between, you know, of mice and men? Uh, is there a difference between mice and men? I, I know I, I don't know the difference. First of all, you know, my, my, my role is, is to try to use mice to mimic humans. So I don't want to to focus on the difference because it's focusing on that is focusing against me. <laughs> but but first of all, what I have seen is in nude mice. Nude mice are eight patients. That's right. In really really not not less than two hundred. CD4, but uh, less than 50. Two, there are drugs. Now, look at, uh, I think it's more a problem, it may be more a problem of drugs. In mice, mice are rapid inactivator of isoniazid. And mice, we gave now, and in this experiment, we gave 10 milligrams per kilo. 10 milligrams per kilo is giving an AUC, which is roughly similar to the AUC in rapid inactivator right. humans, but the peak, the C max, is very high. The C max is, if I remember well, Chuck, you correct me, it's between 10 and 12, something like that, but in the mouse, in the yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's the, the, the C max is three or four times higher, and so perhaps the bactericidal pressure of provoked by INH might be higher in the mouse than in the nude mouse compared to humans. And second, 
I am a little bit surprised by the data you presented, Tim, because for me, intellectually, I think drug resistance means, well, the selection of drug resistance means strong pressure from one drug and lack of pressure for another drug. So you mean that there was high pressure by rifamycin and low pressure by INH. I am very surprised because you have a tendency to show that RIF levels are low. If RIF levels are low, the pressure of this low RIF preservation should be limited. And so it's something that is contradictory. It's, I, I agree. That's very surprising. Well, if I may, and uh, Tim, you may want to comment, but I a few questions, Jack, just real quick. No, I have a mic on, they, and they don't want to hear me anyway, but... Chuck, when you said that they relapsed, you were studying specifically lung tissue. Is that correct in the mice? Yes. Okay. What's kind of interesting in humans is that, at least in our experience, I know the CDC, when they went back and looked at their data, if I'm correct, Tim, that most of the patients who relapsed actually relapsed with, in many of them, extrapulmonary TB that was acquired rifampin resistant. Jacques, any, or, and Tim, either one, but I'm going to turn to Jacques first because he's here and he, he, he can cause me bodily damage. It's going to be harder for you to do it right now. But what's the, chan what's the chances that, you know, that what may be happening may not be just how, mu how much the drug is absorbed from the gut, but how much of it gets into tissues where we don't see the normal TB in HIV-negative individuals? What I'm meaning is that most extrapulmonary TB in HIV-negative individuals is porcy biciliary meaning you never have enough organisms to get the resistance. Whereas the HIV positives or your nude mice are not glossy biciliary. They actually have a lot of organisms in these tissues, enough to create the presence to, co to cause resistance if there was an external pressure, meaning if one drug got through to these tissues in a much higher level. I mean, is that possible? Because it's a different disease. In HIV, I think they're closer, you know, as you were stating before, to maybe more of a lepromatous presentation of leprosy rather than the tuberculosis, and how could that maybe be, you know, influencing the resistance? Chuck, don't give me that you don't know. You, we came, you know, you know everything. So no, 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 I don't know. <laughs> oh no, I am far from <laughs> from knowing everything. Uh, I, I would, I would. Uh, Chuck is willing to to say something. You want to say something? Uh, uh, I don't believe. I don't believe the selection of little mutants would occur more easily in uh, other organs than in lungs. No, I don't either. I don't either. But for the relapse, right? That is possible, right? And perhaps, you know. Us, our nude mice, are infected by aerosol. Right. And we begin treatment uh, two weeks after aerosol infection when they have uh, 10 to the 8 uh, in the lungs. At that time, we have not done that, but uh, we have not studied that in, in detail with the nude mice. With, with the normal mice, when you have... Uh, uh, more than 10 to the 5 in the lungs, they, it becomes to disseminate everywhere. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess in the nude mice, when we began treatment, they should have something like 10 to the 5, I would say, in the lung, in the spleen, everywhere. Uh, much less, much less right. than in the lungs. Because, in fact, Nude mice are nude mice, and uh, we, we inoculate them a lot of tubercle bacilli, and if we don't put them on treatment, they would die, all of them. Right. And it's not some kind of much more chronic disease right. that in humans, when the, they have time to, to develop more the disease. Perhaps we should change our way and uh, inoculate a limited number and let the mice, uh, or to 
I inoculate by IV route right, to disseminate more. And also look at the spleens, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah because yeah. in humans, a lot of these cases have it of areas like the spleen or the psoas abscesses. No, but they are, they right. are in the spleen, but you know, they have no time to. And there are no abscesses, you know. It, 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 they, they, they die. Fast. No, exactly. Die, it's not, it's not that chronic, right? Yeah. Yeah. They have no inflammatory response. Exactly. It's, it's uh, new mice are. They are really, they are a, really ace patients right. uh, who would develop uh, immune reconstitution. They are plenty, right. but there are no possibility to make caseous lesions. There is no caseous lesion in nude mice, not, not at all. You know, there are, there, there are inflammatory response, and that's all. But but like, they're right, in like AIDS patients, yeah, there's very little case, you know, the same yeah, thing. Yeah, it's... Uh, for me, I would say two things. First, our, our data are a proof of concept mm -hmm. that immune status, when the immune status is bad, is bad for the chemotherapy of TB. That's all. I would not do more than that. And second, that perhaps the doses of ANH, RIF, and PTA we give to the mouse are not exactly mimicking, mimicking the conditions in humans. Mm -hmm. And that may explain perhaps the difference. But, but uh, Tim, Tim uh, uh, the, the selection of RIF resistant mutants were mainly in people receiving intermittent rifapentine and uh, intermittent or daily intermittent rifabutin, and perhaps in, in these cases, long exposure, in, intermittent administration of rifapentine or, or rifabutin uh, provokes long exposure to the rifamycin, much longer to the rifamycin than to INH, and that perhaps the, the, the the selective pressure is exactly the opposite of what I have seen in the human mice. But that is speculation. Thank you. I think, Chuck, you have a, qu a comment, right? Well, Jacques just stated exactly the point, and, and this came out in the, the paper that, uh, that we here in Florida, <laughs> including A.G. Halley, uh, published in CID uh, in November of 2009 with the, the lopinavir right. and uh, ritonavir and rifibutin study, and in the discussion, we get into the issue of uh, PK mismatch with long-acting rifamycin. If you have an INH-based um, uh, regimen and you're giving rifibutin or rifapentine, basically every other day, if you're giving intermittent therapy, you have exposure to the rifamycin either above or below the MIC, but really not much of any of the other drugs present. So it may be under those conditions, particularly in the absence of an effective immune response in an HIV-positive patient, that you are essentially giving rifamycin monotherapy, and under those conditions, which are different than what you get in the mouse, um, under those conditions, you are more apt to select for the rifamycin but resistance. Again, and I want to be subtle, but notice even when it was given daily, right, or five times or seven times, he still got it. And I have to say, and again, it was INH resistant. When we went back and looked at our data from Florida, many of our patients were not on intermittent. And I'm not saying, I, I just think, I think that, that there's, there's, I think that example, all I'm going to say, because I don't think we have enough, it's not, you know, is there's, there's, something very, there's something very important, as we're hearing, in that data that I'm not so sure we figured out yet. It needs a lot more mining, you know, and I think it's important. Tim, do you have a, a, a comment on this? Because I don't want to leave you out, but I don't want to ask other questions. Tim, do you, because, uh, do you have a comment on that by any chance? Uh, no, nothing really to add. I just, uh, sorry, I didn't have time to add this stuff on rifibutin ritonavir, because that also, it's an important issue. You know, the optimal dosing of rifibutin uh, with ritonavir and, and the PK data that you've mentioned, what, you know, that you've published, uh, important, and there are a couple other papers, too, supporting concern about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, like I think what Chuck's pointed out, what Jacques pointed out, Tim, what you're pointing out is there's more to this. It's not as simple as it looks like on the surface, and 
going towards that. We have a question kind of that, that relates to that. Uh, we have a question from one of our listeners on the web uh, who's saying uh, he wanted to thank, uh, Richard wanted to thank uh, you guys for your presentations. And he says that his observation is that there's a lag time between data generated with suppositions formulated. And, you know, that's not fair for somebody on the, on the uh, web to ask, use words like supposition formulated for somebody from Brooklyn to try to read. And published guidelines from the ATS CDC. My point is that as a physician who treats many TB and TBHIV co-infected patients, I feel uncomfortable treating the patients by guidelines with a sneaking suspicion there might be a better way any comment. Tim, I'm going to leave that one to you. What do you think about that? Yes. Well, I I agree, and I, I think usually with the guidelines, there's usually fine print somewhere that says uh, this should not substitute for clinical judgment. Uh, but right. but it, it's also difficult to do something that's not consistent with guidelines. And I'd also point out I agree that often the guidelines are generated without having uh, as data as solid as you would like for, for making recommendations on whether that's treatment duration or treatment intermittency, uh, which drugs to use. And I think you'd, I think you'd agree, Tim, this, you know, the problem comes down to this is, these are two very, very complex diseases, and it's amazing the rate that we're learning stuff and, and the amount of information. I mean, I don't remember a time ever where so much information now is available at, at people's fingertips. It's dynamic and it's changing. And I, actually, I, I want to turn the other way and say I think the guidelines, considering everything, have done a very, very good job trying to update. But I think it's one of those things, like you said, Tim, it, it, the bottom line comes down to at the end of it all, it doesn't substitute for clinical judgment. But I think as a whole, it gives us a guideline or at least a, uh, a template to at least to work from. But you're right. Uh, I think uh, he brings up a very good point. It's a, it's a very, very difficult uh, situation, and a lot of times uh, each case presents itself differently in, 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 uh, and can make it very complex. Any questions from our audience here? Eleni, got a question? Because I, I actually have one. Uh, Jacques, I'm going to bother you. I'm going to bother you if it's, a, if, it's a, if it's okay. You, you know, you bring up the thing about a Thambutol, and you know, again, I'm not trying to drive home a point. But it's just my bias. When, when I sat, when I had the pleasure of being a young pup and going out to National Jewish and, and hearing Chuck speak, uh, and hearing, uh, Mike Eisenman and John Sabarro, they, one of the first things that John ever made any one of us th do is he always told us that the more bugs you have, the more drugs you need. You know? And I think that's the issue to a them. So, as a matter of fact, as you were presenting the data, Jacques, I turned to Elena and I said, what would have happened if you used the Thambutol? Would you have present, prevented the INH resistance? And I kind of think what's interesting is everybody keeps talking about using, you know, no, don't use intermittent, you know. But I think maybe the answer is if you have, a, a, you know, a model like the noon mouse or an HIV positive individual, the answer may not be don't, be, don't use as much intermittent, which I actually do think you shouldn't be as intermittent, especially early on where you have a lot of organisms and you need to bring those organisms down. But the next thing may be, should you continue these drugs for a prolonged period of time, you know, to try to prevent, especially when you have a lot of organisms where resistance can still be, you know, be a possibility due to the number of organisms. So, Jacques, I want your comment on the ethambutol, and then I'm going to ask you one more. And, and wait, wait, let me ask you this in talk. Also, the dose of the ethambutol you use would be considered to be in the cidal range in humans. You know, we usually talk about 25 to 50 milligrams per kilogram being within the bimodal sidal range. Any comments on that? I mean, so it's a two-pointed question. Using more drugs, and what about using the dose of etamitol is much higher than we would use in humans. Uh, you, okay. you, you <laughs> I loaded the question. No, no, no. I, love, I love this question because it is my question. <laughs> Oh, wait a second. No, it's my question, Jacques. Don't take away my questions here. <laughs> it is my question. No, no, I mean, it, you're totally right. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look at the curves that I gave mm -hmm. with uh, 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 nude mice and, uh, and uh, bolsy mice, daily treatment and not daily treatment, it's very clear that the, the, the nude mice at... Uh, Two months were much bad, much worse 
certain de, de normal mice, I mean, the, 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 red, the reduction in the safe few count. And so, yes, 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 I think we should continue the four drug treatment for, for these mice. I think it's, it's almost self-evident that we should, uh, the, 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 in fact, <laughs> the two months induction phase is purely theoric. There is no proof of that. It's just because with the standard treatment of TB, at two months, all patients are more or less culture negative, and in the mouse, it's about always between 100 and 1,000 bugs remaining. Exactly. It's enough. Right, but but, but it's, it's not the case here. There right. are two logs more. Exactly. And so we should go and, with, and with, that, with that two logs more, you have more of a chance of having a mutant organism or an organism that carries the mutation that, causes, that at least leads to the resistance. Is that not right? No, no. This guy is going to, to take the words out of my mouth. <laughs> no, did, you you say, totally... did you say the words out of your mouth, did you say? Or um, I, I just keep hearing nice. I'm yeah, sorry. Mouth. Yeah. No, no, you're totally right. You're totally right. I agree entirely. But two... The shock problem, it's our problem that we are discussing, discussing, discussing again. Let's be, let's be provocative. Let's say that what I said with rifaxantin is right. And what I show with rifaxantin is right. Let's say that. Both drugs between us. They are the same. They act by the same mechanism. The only difference between the two is the duration of exposure to the rifamycin. So, if we want to improve rifampicin treatment, rifampicin treatment is very simple. There is only two ways. There is only two ways. One, is increasing the dose of RIF. Let's say double the dose of RIF. But if you double the dose of RIF, let's say we give 10, 20 milligrams per kilo, with a half-life of three hours, you are doubling the, you are doubling the half-life, if I may say, and so you, you you, you, you win one half life and you don't cover the, 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 the whole day. So I am not really in depth. I am not really in favor of that. I am in favor of something much more stupid. Much more stupid! <laughs> it's, it's, which is not feasible. It's to give twice, twice a day 10 milligrams per kilo. And this is what I am going to do in, in the new night. And I am convinced that twice a day, I don't know, it's a problem with the postdoc and the technician to, be, <laughs> to come for, for the weekend <laughs> and to come twice and to treat mice twice a day. And I am convinced if you would give 10 milligrams per kilo at 8 in the morning and 10 milligrams per kilo at 8 in the evening, we will have with FIFA Vivambicin exactly the same as with FIFA yeah, yeah, You know, I mean, I don't believe in miracles. I mean, but what about, what about, and I know this is already being done, but what about also combining it's never it? never been done. No, no, I understand, but what about it, or instead of doing it twice a day? Because just when you try to get your technicians to give mice their drugs twice a day, try to get a, a DOT worker to give their meds twice a day. But what about the, the idea of also combining it, which I know is being done, and I was going to say, rifapentin with long-acting, like, let's say, quinolones, which also have a very, very high, you know, uh, yeah. cytal rate. Yeah, except yeah. that in the mouse, the it quinolones have right not, not long half life. Right, right. But you, you see, what you I, I agree 100% with you, mm -hmm. not only to continue the treatment for longer, in the, in the immunodeficient, the longer, the, 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 the four drugs treatment, but perhaps to give five drugs. Right. To give, to give in addition, 
to the standard drug to give more ciprofloxacin. Right. Or, like some people, but it's, it's a problem of injection, uh, to, to give streptomycin. Right. Streptomycin is a wonderful drug, a wonderful bactericidal drug, to reduce the population. Hmm? Uh, no, I think intellectually we are, we agree. Don't, don't say that too loud, Doc. They respect you. They, you don't want to agree with me. No, no, I mean, <laughs> no, no. Intellectually, I think we all agree. Now, now, how to apply it in practice is not that evident. And wh why? And, and, and for me, it's why? Why do we select the INS resistant mutants right. and other selected resistant mutants? Perhaps the explanation might be in your no. hands. Check. In the sense, it's perhaps a, a PK problem. Perhaps 10 milligrams per kilo INH is it's giving it's, it's too high pressure of isomerization. Perhaps I, I should move to 5 milligrams per kilo, which is very active, 5 milligrams per kilo. But it's certainly less active right. than 10 milligrams per kilo. Mm -hmm. uh, to try to, to create conditions that are similar to the human conditions. Right. You know, I mean, mouse is not mad. <laughs> you know? Oh, well, <laughs> speak for yourself. Um, well, I, Jacques, I, uh, first of all, I, I have to tell you, your passion, your presence, your experience, I can't thank you enough. Uh, it's been a real honor to have you here at AG Holly. Thank you very, very much. Tim? Tim, as always, we miss you here. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, I couldn't you. join you. We, we have your seat all ready for us, but, uh, Tim, I can't thank you enough, again, for a fantastic presentation. I hope to see you real soon. And for right. everybody else, I think with uh, the hallmark of, to me, this lecture by Tim and by Jacques, is any good research, in my opinion, often you have more questions than you have answers. And I think that's exactly what this is about. I want to echo what Jacques said, that I think that anybody going into tuberculosis there's a lot more questions that need to be answered. I think you can have a very, very, you know, I still believe fruitful career. So what I want to do now is I want to thank all of you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Um, please remember uh, to fill out your, you'll be getting emails uh, for you guys on the web. But just fill out them so you can get your CME, CEU credits. Uh, for all of you here, please fill it out before you leave so you can get your CME credits. Remember now, all these lectures are now being archived on the web, so if any of you want to hear it again or you have friends who didn't hear it, please, 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 please uh, recommend that they listen. Uh, other than that, uh, we're very, very happy. We're starting. This is our last grand rounds of the year. Jock, you did a great job. Tim, thank you. Uh, you, you know, and we're going to be starting our next year. We have a couple of great topics coming. Uh, we, we're going to be talking about uh, molecular diagnostics, especially uh, with the new uh, you know, uh, uh, drug-resistant detection for molecular. We'll be doing uh, grand rounds on genotyping, and I know in October that talk about rifapentine, uh, Elsa Villarino uh, is coming from the CDC, and she's going to be talking about the CDC's results, which hopefully will be out by then, or, or at least uh, on uh, rifapentine and their trials. So we're really looking forward to all those. Other than that, if we don't speak to you before the holidays, happy holidays, Thanksgiving the, and the, the, uh, the December holidays to you and your family. A happy and a healthy one. We hope to see you soon at AG Holly or elsewhere. And other than that, uh, at 1230, uh, we, if you wouldn't mind, if any of you are interested, we're going to be actually presenting an M&M, and the M&M actually has to do with um, a lot of the stuff we talked about today, a patient who is HIV co-infected um, who um, unfortunately uh, expired here at Holly and we're going to be presenting. So please join us at 1230. Other than that, Thank you, everybody, for being here with us, and we hope to see you soon. Thanks again. Bye-bye now.